Hi, I'm Chris Kellner. I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery in Mount Sinai. Today, I'm going to tell you about an exciting case that uh, we recently completed. And uh, it's something that hasn't been previously done. And the patient, fortunately, has been doing very well. This is a case of a simultaneous, minimally invasive intracerebral hemorrhage evacuation and pulmonary embolectomy. My conflicts of interest are listed here. I'm involved in a lot of research related to minimally invasive ICH evacuation. I don't accept any consulting fees from any of those companies. And I also have financial interest in companies that I've founded myself or that I've invested in. This is the case of a 57 year old woman who had no past medical history. She was found down at home after a friend called EMS when she was unable to contact the patient for three days. She came into Mount Sinai Morningside where she was found to be somnolent but arousable, oriented to self and near, the right gaze preference. She was moving her right upper extremity but not her other three extremities. She underwent a CT and which you can see here that demonstrated a 36 cc right frontal and basal ganglia intracerebral hemorrhage with intraventricular hemorrhage and midline shift. Initially, her blood pressure was elevated at 164 over 102. She was treated with Keppramanitol and Nicardipine, and she was intubated for airway protection. Then she was transferred to Mount Sinai West, which is our intracerebral hemorrhage center for urgent, minimally invasive ICH evacuation. Upon arrival to the Mount Sinai West emergency room, she was moving her right arm briskly to stimulus but without movement in her other three limbs. Her NIH stroke scale was 23. Her exam appeared stable from when she was at Mount Sinai Morningside. A CTA was performed that demonstrated no aneurysm, no vascular malformation, and no spot sign. This is necessary to progress to minimally invasive ICH evacuation. We want to make sure there's no underlying lesion before going forward with that procedure. And the hematoma was stable at the time of that scan. She was brought straight from the scanner to the operating room. When we moved her to the angio table in the operating room minutes after the scan, she was noted at that time to become hypotensive, tachycardic, and hypoxic. She required vasopressors and increased ventilatory support. At that time, right when she became symptomatic like that, we simultaneously got a call from the radiologist noting that they observed an incidental saddle PE on her CT angiogram. You can see that hypodensity down here in the bottom right image there. You can also see the saddle PE very clearly demonstrated in that CTA uh, in the top right image. A point of care ultrasound was performed, demonstrating a dilated right ventricle and hypokinesis likely related to the pulmonary emboli. The interventional radiology team was called to consider emergent pulmonary embolectomy. The team came in and performed a catheter-directed thrombectomy that does require heparinization. Because she was so symptomatic, we made the decision to go forward with the embolectomy, even though it required heparinization, even though the patient just had a hemorrhage in the brain. Because we were there and ready to perform a decompression if necessary, if the intracerebral hemorrhage were to expand. The interventional radiology team performed the thrombectomy and placed an IVC filter in the same procedure in the angiographic suite in which we were planning to perform the minimally invasive ICH evacuation. As soon as the blood clot was removed, the patient's hemodynamics stabilized immediately. You can see the blood clot here in the bottom right image. Here on the top right image, you can see the guide catheter that the team was using to uh, then perform the embolectomy through that guide catheter. After the embolectomy, a repeat CT was performed on the table, the same table, to evaluate the hematoma. The heparin was reversed. <clears throat> the hematoma was seen at that time to be stable compared to the preoperative imaging, and there were no new intracerebral hemorrhages. At that point, we made the decision to move forward with the minimally invasive ICH evacuation, given that was our original reason for coming into the procedure room. And the same indication still stood for performing that procedure. As previously, we had now been able to reverse uh, the heparin that the patient had been on for the pulmonary embolectomy. So we moved forward with that procedure. A right frontal burr hole was made and using navigation guided, using stereotactic guidance to make that burr hole in line with the trajectory to guide the surgiscope into the blood clot. The device that was used is called an Aurora surgiscope, which has two components. This right here is a scope. It's an endoport. This is a trocar that goes inside the endoport for traversing the brain. 
And there's a camera here that uses a prism to look down the length of the port. So the individual using the port will be using an instrument down the port next to the view of the camera. Here's an evacuator. This evacuator also goes down the port and has the ability to aspirate and morselate. And a newer version has the ability to also irrigate and coagulate. So this is a multifunctional cannula that goes down the port and can aid in aspirating and removing the hematoma. Here's some more detail for the surgiscope. There are some lights on the inside here that light your view. This obturator tip is removed after the endoscope is in place. Uh, here's the handle that's removed, and then the instrument will go down this channel alongside the view that the camera is able to see. The procedure starts with a burr hole. Here's placement of the endoscope, of the surgiscope. Here's the view from inside the surgiscope. You can see the camera view is coming down from 12 o'clock. And at six o'clock, we've got the uh, aspirator. <clears throat> you can see the blood here, and you can see it looks like it's uh, blood that's at least a few hours old. It's not hyperacute, which is pure red and, and orange, but there's some purple clot components that are well formed here. So we know this has been here at least for a few hours. Here on the right, you start to see some brain. Uh, as the brain closes in, you direct the scope away from the brain into an area where there's pure clot, uh, and then you're able to continue the evacuation in that location. After uh, about 30 to 45 minutes, I was able to remove the entire hematoma, and you're able to see the brain closing in, and the area where the hematoma was was multiple centimeters wide, and now you can see that the brain is closing in to about the width of the surgiscope, which is one centimeter. And you can see there's nothing active bleeding there. And I'm irrigating down the channel to verify there's nothing active. We're able to do a CT on the table immediately after the procedure. And uh, here you can see the blood clot was present here, which is mostly removed. I also placed an EVD uh, at the time of the procedure in the ventricle under direct visualization through the surgiscope. On post-op day one, we obtained a CT and saw that there was a small amount of residual blood here in the lateral basal ganglia, but that the majority of the blood clot had been removed. And importantly, the midline appeared largely restored uh, and was no longer deviated from right to left. As previously, you can see the uh, EVD in place here in the left lateral ventricle. Here's the patient. Uh, one month later, she really made an excellent recovery. Sorry, three months after the bleed, she had a slight drift in her left arm, which we're able to see here. I'll play this a little bit here. So I'm going to put your arms down. <clears throat> okay, lift up both your arms like this. Hold them up like that. You see a little bit of a drift on the okay, left. Okay. Put them out like this. Here's her walker, which she's walking with. And but even at this point, this only normal. three months after this uh, potentially deadly it's situation, she was living sides. at home alone uh, with no assistance. Here she is six months later. Now she's neurologically intact. She's living at home independently. Um, she's walking normally. And her MRI showed a cavity where the hematoma had been, but you can see this cavity is much smaller than the size of the hematoma. And interestingly, the cavity does not go down into the basal ganglia very much, just a little bit lateral to the caudate. And this is likely how she was able to do so well that much of the basal ganglia was uh, spared and restored. The entire thalamus was spared. Um, and so this predominantly frontal and lateral basal ganglia bleed, this patient was able to recover very well from uh, after this treatment course. In conclusion, minimally invasive ICH evacuation is feasible. Concurrently with pulmonectomy in a patient presenting with concurrent large intracerebral hemorrhage and pulmonary embolism, this requires a group of highly specialized teams, and this multidisciplinary collaboration is possible in an academic center where we can collaborate in ways previously not possible to optimize outcome for our patient. Thanks very much.